Simply Scuba presents the Deco Stop Podcast. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deco Stop Podcast. I'm Mark, a former dive instructor, and I'm here to talk about scuba diving and stuff. Um, it's been a weird week this week. I uh, I started off the week with sunburn, because uh, I was sort of wearing shorts and I was out in the garden, and today I'm in a jumper and it's snowing outside. It's it, it's weird, climate change. Um, but anyway, um, jumping straight into... Oh, and also we had um, uh, we had April the 1st, so, um, so a lot of April Fools. Um, although I'm literally recording recording this on April Fool's Day. I've seen a couple of things. The first one was um, from Fourth Element. They um, they announced their Scout Attenborough mask, um, which is a new sort of mask lens, uh, which sort of helps you see some uh, sort of like amazing sea creatures um, because they're basically just stickers on the inside of the mask. So you're always seeing this sea turtle in your eye. That was kind of funny. Um, deep dive in, uh, in Dubai. They um, they made a, a shot that they'd introduced a shark into their um, sort of indoor uh, diving pool. That was kind of fun. Uh, and that's about it so far. Um, but saying that, it's still quite early in the day, so uh, there's still more time. Um, for, for anyone who did get um, sort of upset about uh, about my April Fool's on, uh, on Ars Mark, I'm dreadfully sorry, but it's, it's the done thing, isn't it? Uh, but I promise you that everything on today's show will be uh, sort of upright and, yeah. April the 1st has been and gone. Um, so, yeah, first off, starting with website updates for Simply Scuba. Um, so, yeah, we're in a new month, so we've updated the front page um, with a few new uh, sort of interesting favorite products. So head over to that, check them out. Um, looking at new in, we've got some Orca swimwear. So this is for uh, open water swimming. So swim caps and uh, and swimming wetsuits, open water swimming, uh, gloves, all that kind of exposure protection if you're into your open water swimming that I know a lot of you are, uh, as well as quite a few Roxy um, uh, like long sleeve swimsuits, uh, like sort of rash vesty style swimsuits uh, with some pretty funky styles. Um, and one that I quite like the look of, which is the uh, the Roxy 1mm Synchro. Um, not for myself, unfortunately, but um, I... I I don't think I'd fit into it personally. Um, but yeah, it's like a one mil long sleeve rash guard. Um, so it's just got a little bit of a sort of extra warmth. So uh, if you're thinking about going diving this summer and uh, and you want just a little extra, then uh, it might be worth checking that out. It's got a good uh, sort of funky design to it. Um, we've also added a new, um, I mean, I say it's new. We've always had a wish list function on the website where if you like the look of something, you can add it to like a wish list. Um, but now we just made it a little bit easier. You can actually do that from the department page. There's a little star uh, in the top right-hand corner if you hover over it, and uh, and if you click on that, it just adds it to your wish list. Um, one thing that kind of bugs me is that you click on the star, and the star turns into a heart. Um, I don't know why, but that sort of doesn't make sense in my mind. I get that it's like a wish list, and it's like, yeah, you've liked this, um, but I don't know, the star turn, uh, whatever. Um, Mara's announced their newest regulator to their range for 2022, which is the Mara's Atlas. Um, I actually have a sample on on the way to me now that I can actually talk about it. Um, but this is like their new, I suppose, sort of flagship regulator, um, as far as I'm aware. I, I haven't um, sort of done too much research in, uh, too, research into it yet um, until I get the sample. Um, but yeah, it, it's top of the range regulator and when it's from Mara's it means that it's got a very nice smooth breathe it's an all metal regulator uh, so it's like the successor to Abyss almost which was an all metal second stage um, with a bypass tube and all that sort of clever stuff so um, yeah as soon as I get the uh, the video and the green light for that that shall be released um, yeah moving on to YouTube so Friday's Ask Mark I was asked about semi-dry wetsuits um, whole group uh, sort of DSMBs, whether every single person should send up a DSMB when you're diving in a group, um, and whether you should take Dive Master, um, but with no intentions of going professional. And that was quite a tricky one because they they were genuinely asking whether they just wanted to improve their diving, whether it was worth taking the Dive Master course. And it's, it's another one of those yes and no. It's like, well, yeah, because it will make you a better diver. It'll teach you more about the, the physics and all that kind of stuff about diving. Um, um, but 
is it worth it if you're not going to use it um especially going forwards because well yeah you're gonna have to pay your your membership fees going forwards is it is it really worth um sort of paying for us at all of that or is it just sort of something that you could just learn by yourself so that was kind of a tricky interesting question that i spent a bit of time on um saturday's ask google or google answered i forget what it's called uh was on dive computers some interesting uh, sort of questions from google coming through there this sunday's dive brief was on backpack oh, back plate components um i've been getting quite a few sort of questions and comments about sort of getting started into backplate diving and I think there is a big movement into more and more divers moving into backplates so I just figured I'd just do a dive plate on right uh, I do a dive brief on backplates that's surprisingly hard to say um just about what you need um to sort of build a complete set and um it's a very quick brief funnily enough um on just yeah harness back plate wing accessories uh, and that's kind of it uh, on tuesday we got top tips on fins um last week was bolt snaps i think uh but this week it's going to be on fins um and i think that's about it from social channel update so jump straight into the news in Plymouth, a set of waste sharks have been released into the waters of Turnchapel to help collect just trash in the water uh, around there. This is kind of a, um, uh, a test to see how they work. Um, so these devices, they're like, I say little robots, they, they weigh about 72 kilos. Um, but they're, they're just these small little robot sort of boats that kind of cruise around on the surface uh, with a big open like mouth on the front just collecting trash that's floating on the surface um they're, they're quite cool. Um, they're, they're not cheap if you want one. Uh, if you want an autonomous one, uh, that will set you back about 34,000 euros. Um, there, there's quite a lot of technology in it because it's got all the LiDAR and all that kind of stuff. Uh, even a manual version that's like remote control is 23,000. Uh, you can, of course, lease them out. Um, but these are, yeah, sort of being used as part of their um, their preventing plastic pollution project, the, uh, the old quad um, and they're yeah first being trialed in uh, in turn chapel to see sort of how well it does in collecting uh, sort of rubbish um, before they're hoping to operate it in uh, the wider cata water um, which is known for a lot of litter to uh, to sort of gather around um, so this is working in collaboration with plymouth based robotics and artificial intelligence experts uh, expertise expertise that doesn't make sense experts um the msubs and marine ai to um to look to see if they can just sort of yeah adapt this technology um to um just sort of have like almost a small fleet of these a bit like a rumba um just to kind of cruise around every now and then and uh, and collect marine trash now I've been playing a lot of um, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn recently, um, so this has like sort of early connotations of that of just these little robots that just cruise around and uh, sort of clean up after us, uh, which in one way is a nice thing because of course it's collecting marine trash, um, but hopefully it won't make us sort of get lazy uh, in um, sort of just throwing stuff wherever we want to. Um, obviously, I I know a lot of this like marine trash is. Not honestly, but you, you put it in a bin and then it blows over or something. It's not just someone throwing it in the water, but a lot of the times it is just someone throwing stuff in the water. Um, but this is kind of cool um, just to uh, sort of see that this technology is being sort of like tested out and uh, and like sort of local communities are looking to invest in this kind of technology to um, to see how it's... Um, uh, how it works and um, actually at the bottom of the article it says that Babcock has also purchased a, a waste shark um, to be helping collect plastic waste from waters around the dockyard um, and cut plastic pollution within the city so um, yeah this sort of new technology is, is quite cool and um, yeah sort of going forwards you might see sort of one of these things i think the especially the autonomous version it has like a geofence thing so it's using like 
GPS or whatever to basically say, well, don't leave this area. Uh, but if it's anything like my Roomba, uh, yeah, sometimes it gets lost. But yeah, we'll probably start to see these things kind of cruising around. They only go about three miles an hour or something, I think I saw. Um, they're not particularly fast. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's sort of, this is the future that we're living in. And um, yeah, you, you, you'll probably start to see these cruising around your waterways soon. The next news story comes from Australia, where a very unusual creature was rescued from a very busy sea harbour. It was a, uh, a terrified possum who was found just clinging onto a mooring buoy just in the middle of the harbour. And um, it, it was actually a, a scuba diver, uh, Luke English, uh, from Red Boat Scuba Diving um, in, uh, in Portsea. And uh, yeah, he was just sort of out and about sort of on his boat and he, he saw this poor little critter um, just clinging for dear life. And um, later on, he, um, he sort of returned with a, um, a couple um, uh, sort of rangers or something. And they, um, they sort of cruised up to it. It's um, it got a little bit frightened when they got too close, so it jumped into the water. But luckily, the the rangers managed to sort of fish it out with some water, uh, uh, some fishing gear, and um, and they rescued it. They brought it back to dry land, where a vet uh, checked it out and said that, yep, it's all perfectly healthy. And uh, and they they reckon it was probably just nesting on a nearby boat. And yeah, when they started the engines or whatever, started to make sail, whatever it was, it panicked, jumped into the water, and the first sort of dry land that it could reach was this mooring buoy. And um, and yeah, he he just was sort of found there, clinging on for for dear life. Um, it's not really something that uh, that you see every day. Um, but this um, uh, this diver, Luke English, said that he's rescued like pet dogs and even stranded penguins um in the past but yeah this is his very first possum that he's ever found um but yeah just thought that was a little bit interesting um a, a scuba diver rescuing a um a, a possum it's it's an unusual one it was a, a technically it was a brush tail possum i'm uh, i'm reading um but yeah he it, it it, everybody came off perfectly fine i think they were prepared to like throw on wetsuits they had surfboards and all that kind of stuff to um, to do like an in-water rescue um but it wasn't required they just used a, a big like fishing nets just to scoop it out of the water uh, and then they assessed it and then set it on its merry way uh, on dry land obviously but yeah that's a little bit different um i think i have i have seen a um a scuba diver clinging on for dear life onto a mooring buoy they got separated in uh, in current and um, there's this huge search party. This was years and years ago. Um, they basically called around to all boats in the area just to look out for this missing diver. And, uh, and one boat managed to uh, to find him just holding on to a, um, a mooring buoy. Um, I, I always feel bad for uh, for one of our group who was feeling like really bad motion sickness uh, sort of at the time. And they're like, no, sorry, we're just going to have to just cruise around in in, in a search pattern uh, until we uh, until we find this guy. And it's like, oh, we'll we'll get back to uh, to dry land shortly. He was just like in the fetal position on the on the deck of the boat, um, really really not enjoying this um, this search party. But uh, yeah, happy ending. Everybody got found. Um, everybody. Got found uh, he was perfectly fine the uh, the scuba diver and uh, and yeah my buddy got to, uh, to dry land safely and finally, the court case following the death of a student in 2016 has resulted in a hung jury this week here in the UK. During the dive, the student was said to have been very low on gas for this deep dive, and whilst ascending signalled that they were out of air, so a separate dive master donated one of their second stages for the student to breathe from, whilst that dive master switched to a separate cylinder themselves. But then later, whilst at 12 metres depth, the student signalled a again that they were out of air. When the dive master on trial donated air to them and switched to their separate tank, 
During the safety stop at five meters, the students signaled again that they were signaling to, uh, oh, sorry, struggling to breathe and tried to pull themselves up a buoy line before completing the safety stop, at which point the dive master on trial allegedly pulled them back down to complete the safety stop for three minutes. The dive master, of course, denies this, uh, stating that whilst they did have hold of the student briefly to prevent them from bolting to the surface and reminded them about the need to complete the safety safety stop, there was no way that they could have physically restrained the student in that way due to their size if they seriously wanted to go to the surface. This decision, though, has been called into question due to the safety stop, which, while it was part of the dive plan, it was not essential to complete and likely led to the death of the student from drowning and subsequent cardiac arrest. After all of the testimony and the evidence, though, the jury of 11 people, because one had tested positive for COVID-19, they could not come to a majority decision either way, and now the Crown Prosecution Service will be considering whether or not to proceed with a retrial for man's slaughter. Uh, they are expected to announce their decision next week, but in the meantime, the dive master has been released from prison on bail. Now, it's just a terrible situation that's only being made worse for everybody involved by extending it even further. Uh, but yeah, it's just a terrible situation. And almost one of the reasons why I sort of, not consciously, but just stopped teaching because I always remember talking to one of my uh, sort of other instructors who I think actually taught me, but uh, but then we ended up teaching together a lot, and uh, and they basically said that it's it's almost a matter of time before something like this happens, um, and it's it's almost out of your control. But yeah, something bad is inevitably going to uh, to happen, and you can only pray that you do the right thing perfectly at the right time. Um, and yeah, it's just it's horrible for everybody involved. And moving swiftly on, because I don't like to uh, sort of leave you guys in uh, in that kind of mental space, uh, I'm going to move quickly on to my product of the week, which this week is the Apex Thermic 8mm wetsuit. Uh, I say wetsuit, it's technically a semi-dry, but semi-dries are, I suppose, technically wetsuits. They, um, they just have better seals and, um, yeah, whilst... Whilst I often say that they're like halfway between a wetsuit and a dry suit, they're, they're not really. They're just a wetsuit that you stay dry in for a long amount of time, and then when the water does eventually make its way into the suit, doesn't really matter because it's still nice and warm. Um, but this uh, this was actually one of the questions on, uh, on Friday's Ask Mark, which is what's the best uh, semi-dry at the moment? And yeah, this one, hands down is the the best semi dry in my opinion at the moment the uh, the apex thermic because they sent me a sample truth uh, a year or two ago when um, just before it first came out and it's normally when i see like eight seven mil on a wetsuit i just kind of groan a little bit because it's just a lot of material and they're always really cumbersome you feel like the michelin man trying to move around in them but this one when i was putting on you're like wow I can I can move I can touch my ankles um I can't normally touch my ankles but I can touch my ankles whilst wearing the uh, the thermic and it's very easy to put on and when it's on yeah you can move freely it doesn't feel restrictive like a lot of uh, thicker wetsuits it feels like you it's always pulling you back when you're trying to sort out your fins or something but with this one it's got like limestone based super stretch neoprene so yeah incredibly flexible and very easy to uh, to put on and take off all by yourself because you've got that front zipper across your chest so you can do it all by yourself you don't have to worry for uh, wait for your buddy to uh, to zip you um yeah it's got everything that you need because it's got that integrated hood as well and because of the overall design, it's got like an internal bib, which is quite clever. It means that as soon as you get in, uh, well, yeah, you do feel very, very buoyant. Uh, it's quite a buoyant suit, but you don't get that immediate cold rush of water down your back, down your spine that you have to endure. That You don't get that in this suit. It took quite a long time for any water to seep its way into the suit. So nice and, uh, and warm and sort of 
insulating. Um, it's quite practical as well. It's got those thigh pockets built into them. Um, now I only ever dive with thigh pockets. Uh, it's just a much more convenient way of just storing things. I don't use BCD pockets. I can't really bend my arm that way and organize things and kind of feel what's going on. So whereas if you've got thigh pockets, you can, it's a convenient place for uh, for storage and to be able to organize stuff and just, it's much more practical. So I only ever dive with uh, thigh pockets nowadays. Even if I'm just diving in like a rash vest, I'll wear fourth element tech shorts just so that I have those thigh pockets instead of board shorts. Uh, but the Thermic has them built in as well. So you do have that thigh um, uh, thigh pockets. Uh, but yeah, I just thought that um, that would make sense to be my product of the week because because uh, I was asked about it. And yeah, it is just a lovely, lovely suit. Um, if I didn't dive in my dry suit as much, then yeah, this would be the uh, the semi dry that I invest in because it is just so darn comfortable. It's sensible styling as well. It's nothing too out there, uh, but it's not solid black neither. You've got that sort of grey melange on the uh, on the shoulders and the head. Um, yeah, if I did only dive in uh, in wetsuits and I wanted to dive for longer, deeper, or in colder waters, then yeah, I'd invest in the Apex Thermic. And finally, onto my question of the week, which this week is, what is DSMB etiquette? Um, so this is mainly for newer divers. Um, if they are sort of a little bit worried about going on a liverboard or something, what, what do you do with a uh, DSMB? I just figured that I'd, I'd break it down for you, make it a little bit easier. And again, this is a question on, uh, on Friday's Ask Mark about basically if you're diving in a group of, say, two or three buddy pairs and you come up to do a, a safety stop, does everybody send up a, a DSMB? And um, uh, the usual thing is no. Now on a liverboard, if you're on like a week long dive trip, then typically you're gonna do your check dive on day one, obviously. Um, and that's gonna be a pretty safe, safe dive, nothing too deep, just making sure that everything's working. But this is when, this is one of the, the rare instances where it's kind of expected for everybody to send up a DSMB. It's just for the practice to make sure that a you can do it safely um, because years ago when uh, I mean when I was teaching I was probably the last generation of um, sort of well, teaching at that time when it wasn't part it wasn't a standard part of the course we taught some of the divers to do it but it wasn't a, a standardized thing it was just if we had the time and um, and the sort of equipment for everyone to uh, to do it but we we'd like demonstrate it but it wasn't really part of the required course i think now it is actually part of the um sort of entry level course that divers learn how to send up a dsmb and obviously now there's a, a speciality for it but during your um, uh, that preliminary, that first check dive, yeah, it's kind of expected that everybody goes for the dive. You then actually do your safety stop. Then everybody sends up their DSMB just so that you don't do it, Mary Poppins, and yank everybody up to the surface. Um, but that's kind of the only instance that I can think of where everybody in a group sends up a DSMB like simultaneously, just because. If you have multiple people sending up um, DSMBs, then that's a lot of line all going up quite close to one another. And when you have wind movement and stuff on the surface, they're all going to twist and turn and move in different areas, and you're all going to end up getting tangled up. So it is not really worth everybody sending up their DSMB all at the same time. It is important, uh, in my opinion, that every diver has their own DSMB and reel or spool just in case they get separated. For whatever reason, whether it's current or you just get turned around, divers do get separated. And at that point, I send up a DSMB um, just so that anyone on the surface knows where I am. If my buddy is sort of around as well, looking for me, then they can immediately see my DSMB. They can see roughly where I am or where I'm gonna surface so they can, um, uh, so we can get back together. And it, yeah, it is just a safety thing. But if you're in a group of divers, 
and you're all sort of coming up to do the same safety stop uh, towards the end, then I just I usually nominate one person just to send up a DSMB. And then as long as you stay close to one another, then that's usually best. You don't have to send up too many DSMBs. Um, the only other time where I'd send up a separate DSMB is if we're diving from a, a smaller Zodiac uh, rib because if you can't fit, you basically you can't always fit as many divers that you went out on um, on the way back just because you take all the gear off and um, when you're climbing back in, you can't always fit as many divers uh, on the on the return journey. So they'll usually make two pickups. At that point, if the like second half of the group is left in the water, then send up a uh, or just inflate an SMB when you're on the surface, so that there's always an SMB on the surface, so that uh, yeah, basically you don't get run over, uh, but also so that your rib can like keep an eye on you and uh, and you're not going to uh, to dis uh, disappear. But otherwise, yeah, it is just um, sort of send it up whenever you want um, towards the end of the dive to let the surface know that hey there's a diver down here and uh, and this is where I'm going to be surfacing because when you're under the water those bubbles that you're breathing they're really hard to spot uh, especially if the boat is moving at any speed so it, it's worth sending up a DSMB but I wouldn't do it too early neither um, especially if you're planning on moving because I've had to tow uh, permanent SMBs so inflated at the start of the dive and you hold on to the reel and you drag it behind you that sucks um, mainly because we were swimming against the wind of course the uh, the divers sort of the, the other divers in my group didn't know that because they weren't holding on to this inflatable thing that was on the surface, uh, having to drag it uh, so along. And of course, you can feel every wave just pulling you backwards every now and then. So um, yeah, they're not great fun. Uh, if you if you do want to uh, sort of do it early, try and do it when you're not planning on doing any kind of swimming in a direction because yeah, it just sucks. And try and keep that line as taut as possible. Um, if you um, if you're preparing your your DSMB and your uh, and your reel, don't pay out very much line, if any, because line strings and rope underwater are just pure evil, um, and they're often neutrally buoyant, so they just kind of float and move around in the water. They wrap around things, they get tangled. So yeah, try and keep the slack to a minimum um, just get your dsmb out attach it onto your reel uh, pay out struth like 50 centimeters of line if that just to give you a bit of a uh, bit of sort of wiggle room between the reel and the spool uh, sorry between the um, the dsmb and the spool and then inflate it so um, so that there's there's minimal uh, slack line and then as you're ascending wind it back in as soon as possible because at the beginning when you're sort of coming up from five meters it's really easy to uh, to wind it in but then towards the end because you're bo you're getting more and more buoyant as you ascend you have to wind it in faster and faster to uh, to catch up um, yeah I, I see a lot of divers once they reach that like three meters and they keep going they're, they're like winding really really quickly trying to uh, sort of catch up and they got all this line around so yeah just try and keep on top of that try not to focus too much on it so you can control your buoyancy and and then sort of stay down wind some line in so you can reel it back in um, and always try and keep some tension on that line as well as long as there's tension on the line it means that your smb is sticking straight up out of the water if it flops down it kind of defeats the point um, so if if there's like slack in your um, in your line then your dsmb is flopped over on the surface and whilst boats probably will be able to see it it's easier to see from one side um but no if you just sort of yank it down a little bit only about 10 centimeters or something it doesn't need to be much but by pulling the bottom under the water you really make it stand up really nice and tall out of the water uh, to uh, to make yourself stand out so um yeah th those are my main points just slack line to a minimum uh, and just 
just nominate one person in a group as long as you're fairly close together if you do end up getting separated then yeah have your own dsmb so you can send that up um but otherwise yeah just have as as few as possible in the water just so it's it's less equipment it's less line just floating around in the water uh, and less likely to go wrong and that's it for another week thank you so much for listening everybody um don't forget to like and subscribe and do all that kind of social media stuff give us five stars and all that uh comment where you can if you're watching this on youtube then you can obviously comment uh but some of the other uh, channels that this goes on you can't um don't forget to head over to simplyscuba.com uh we do sell some pretty interesting stuff i'm going to pop some links to all of the stuff that i uh, mentioned at the uh, at the top of the show as well as that uh, apex thermic semi dry and of course if you do have any questions comments queries or corrections to anything that you've heard pop it down in the comments in uh, in youtube and if you use the hashtag ask mark i will mention it in next friday's show or or a ask mark because I do get quite a few comments and I do have to uh, sort of prioritize them unfortunately um, so yeah just hashtag ask mark and uh, and I will find it thank you so much for listening everybody and of course safe diving mm-hmm.